Tell me the uh, difference between this and other distributed ledgers. Uh, tell me what a distributed ledger is first. Yes, a distributed ledger is a way that a group of computers can come to an agreement, usually an agreement on the ordering of some transactions, maybe an agreement on what time each transaction reached the community as well. But we want to come to an agreement, even though we don't trust any particular computer. That's what a ledger is. And it's all about trust. Sometimes people confuse it. They say, well, there is no trust involved. No, no, there's always trust involved. If everybody's out to get me, then I'm just out of luck. Here's what it really is, is that I don't want to have to trust any one person in the community, to be honest. I just want to have to trust that the community as a whole doesn't have too many bad apples in it. That's all. So I want to trust that there may be a few bad people, but even if those people are colluding and working together, and even if there's bad firewalls cutting us off from each other and colluding with the bad people, uh, we'll still have security, we'll still keep running, we'll still get the right answers, we'll still come to all come to the same agreement, we'll still come to an agreement. That's what distributed ledgers are about. It's building trust in the final result, that our election was fair, or that our money isn't being forged, all those sorts of things, or that documents aren't being changed when they shouldn't. We're coming to trust on the, given, on the final result, given that we trust that no, no small number of colluding bad apples can ruin the whole barrel. Okay, so that's what a ledger is. We want to be able to come to an agreement on this. Uh, there are actually a lot of different ways, five really different ways of trying to go about building a ledger. And the first one was not Bitcoin. The first one was these 30-year-old algorithms that, are, that I call voting algorithms to distinguish them from the other four. Voting algorithms um, are pretty complicated, but we all send votes to each other on some yes, no question. Of course, it's kind of hard to put things in order just knowing yes, no questions, so that it raises a whole different issue. But, and it's kind of hard to get a good timestamp just given yes, no questions, but that's a different issue. The voting algorithms start off with yes, no questions, and then they can extend it. The problem is we all send each other votes, and then we send each other receipts about our votes, and then I have to tell other people how other people voted, which gets really blows up. Uh, and then we go through multiple rounds of this, and then at the end, all we know is a single yes, no question. Is it secure? Oh, it's beautiful security proofs. Very, very strong math proofs that we've had for decades on the security. Uh, it could even be fair in some senses, although getting fair ordering actually doesn't come out of any of the systems I've seen proposed. But it is slow. So slow, I don't even know if anyone's ever done it. So these are the pure voting systems. They're the first ones. Then you have proof of work. Proof of work says, well, we'll just have a chain of blocks, and each block will have a bunch of transactions in it. You know, maybe moving money between wallets. That was sort of the first application of this. But then we extend it to changing our shared data layer or running smart contracts and recording their results, you know, those sorts of things. There's lots of things you can do with this chain. And the idea is, as a community, we'll all agree that this block, this set of transactions, this list in an order of transactions is the first one. And then as a community, we'll all agree that this next one gets put on top of it. And then the next one. Oh, but how do we do that? Well, we just say somebody can raise their hand and say, oh, here's a block to put on top. And then somebody else can raise their hand and say, oh, here's another block to put on top. And then we'll just do it in that order, the order they raise their hands. Oh, but what if two people raise their hand at the same time? You could have our stack, our chain, and then at the top, you could have two different blocks trying to be put on at the same time. Well, now my chain is forking and turning into a tree. Well, that's not helpful. Because when it was a chain, I knew what order everything was in. But if it turns into a tree, then I don't know what order everything is in. So here's what we'll do. We'll have the community as a whole always add on, if it splits, always add on to whichever one they think is longer. And so if you think this one's longer, you keep adding on to this. And if I think this one's longer, I keep adding on to this. And as long as we can talk pretty fast, then eventually we'll all kind of agree on which one's longer. And we'll eventually say, OK, this is going to be the real one. We'll chop off this one. And now we're back to a chain again. Oh, but wait, what if we're adding so fast that it forks faster than we can chop off the forks? It takes a while for us to figure out which of the two forks to chop off and which one to keep. What if it forks again before we finish chopping off the first fork? If, it's, if the hydra is growing more heads faster than we can cut them off, then we collapse and it doesn't work. So we have to slow ourselves down on purpose. That's called proof of work. Proof of work is anybody can raise their hand and add a block, but first they have to solve a math puzzle. The math puzzle doesn't 
actually accomplish anything for humanity, but it's just a hard math puzzle that you have to, to solve, and you don't know what the puzzle is until we know the previous block. So when you get a block on top of the chain, if you want to put a new one on top, you look at this block to know what math puzzle you need to solve, and then you work on solving it, and that put, you put the next one on top. And if it's really hard, then only people who buy a supercomputer called a mining rig and use lots of electricity are going to be able to solve this fast enough to get the next block on top. And so then we have a blockchain that works. But this means that we are wasting both money and electricity to build a system that is slow on purpose. The whole purpose of the mining rigs is to slow down the system. The reason we did proof of work in the first place was to make it slower, which isn't terribly conducive to being fast. If you want a fast system, your first step shouldn't be, hmm, how can I slow this down? That doesn't really make it fast. Okay, so this is widely understood, widely used. I see a theme here. The voting systems weren't fast, and then the blockchain isn't fast. Um, but leader-based comes to the rescue. You think about it, well, if I want to be fast, and I want to um, not have to have a mining rig, I know what I'll do. I'll just be the dictator. Everybody send me your transactions. I will arbitrarily pick them in whatever order I want. And if I don't like you, maybe I'll leave out yours, but eh, tough for you. But I'll just put them in whatever order I want because I'm the dictator. And then I will tell everybody what order I put them in. And then everybody can digitally sign, yes, I agree to that order. And now we have a consensus of the community. And then that's the order. Um, that actually works. And it's been around for a long time. Um, in the database community and other communities, people have been building leader-based systems, Paxos and Raft and, and uh, PBFT, you know, go way back. Uh, and there's lots of people in the blockchain world, in the ledger world, uh, using these uh, leader-based systems. And, um, and so you can do that. Are there any problems with it? Well, first of all, it has a leader. You know there's DDoS attacks? Distributed denial of service attacks. Where somebody compromises a bunch of little computers around the internet. They hack into printers and web cameras and DVRs and baby monitors. They hack into these little tiny computers all over the internet. And this is going to be much worse when we get to an Internet of Things world, which is a whole other discussion. And then they tell them all to flood one computer with messages. And that computer just is so flooded with messages it can't talk to anybody or hear what anybody else is saying. Essentially, it shuts it down for as long as the flood continues. Now remember, I said we don't build trust out of it, nothing. If their botnet is so big, that they can shut down every network in our computer, every computer in our network, then obviously our network stops working as long as the attack goes on. But we don't want our, ourselves to be fragile. If it's a smaller botnet, and all it can do is shut down one computer at a time, or maybe two computers at a time, or three computers at a time, if it's a small botnet, we don't want our whole network to get shut down just because you shut down one or two or three computers. So we want denial of service resilience. We don't want it to be denial of service proof, but we want denial of service resilience. But in a leader-based system, if I'm the dictator, they could flood me with packets and shut me down. Then what happens? Well, there is an answer. What happens is that after a few seconds, everybody says, oh, Lehman stopped talking. I think we will elect a new leader. And then they elect a new leader, and now you're the leader. And now you get to be the dictator and pick the order of the transactions. Here's the problem. Imagine that one of the computers has a virus or a worm or malware or is malicious. Because it's in the network, it has to know who the leader is at any given moment. We all have to know who the leader is. But if it knows who the leader is, and if it's talking to the botnet, it can say, hey botnet, he's the leader now. Everybody flood him. And so the botnet plays follow the leader. And it just follows the leader as we go from leader to leader and it shuts down the entire network for as long as the attack goes on. And there are leader-based systems where we just have a ring of a small number of people and every two seconds you go to the next person. But if you have one computer that's infected that knows the timing, the botnet can just follow you around the ring and shut you down. So that's a problem. Also, although leader-based is <laughs> orders of magnitude faster than proof of work, it's really nice for that, it's still not as fast as you would want. If there's a thousand computers in the network and you're the leader, you're going to have to tell the order you picked to a thousand computers and get back the signatures from a thousand computers and maybe even tell them each other's signatures. Um, a pure leader-based system is going to slow you down. You're going to slow down with the number of nodes that way, which is kind of 
why it would be nice to not have leaders for that reason too. Maybe we could actually get faster than a leader-based system. There's the potential in the internet to even be faster than leader-based. And there's definitely a need to be more secure than leader-based. So, we had the old voting systems, we had proof of work. The voting systems were too slow because there's too many votes. The only problem with the voting system is it has votes. Then there was the proof of work. The only problem there is that proof of work is a way of slowing us down on purpose, which has the effect of slowing us down. Go figure. Then we had leader-based systems. No proof of work. I like that. We're not going to waste a 1,200th of the electricity of humanity. Uh, or, you know, one coin isn't going to cost as much electricity as I could run my house for a week. We're not going to have that problem with the leader-based system, but it's fragile. Denial of service attacks can shut it down. And there have been, we can talk about it, but there have been a lot of denial of service attacks. My guess is they're going to grow up, go up in the future, and that as we go into a world with Internet of Things, it's going to get worse before it gets better. I think it's going to get a lot worse. So that's a problem. Then we have something that I wasted far too much time trying to work out over the last five years. And that would be, I call it simulated economy. You'll sometimes hear people say proof of stake. Um, terminology is weird. Sometimes people use blockchain to refer to all five of these things. Every ledger is a blockchain. Sometimes people use proof of stake to refer to all the economy-based systems and just those. Um, technically, proof of stake really has a different meaning. It just means that you're weighted according to your stake. But people often mean it. So to be clear, I'm going to use the terminology an economy-based system. An economy-based system is a cool idea, which is why I spent so much time on it. Um, and I wasn't able to figure it out, but you know, maybe other people can. In an economy-based system, we all just kind of talk to each other randomly. Ooh, I like that. No DDoS attacks here. Or at least we're resilient. We talk to each other randomly, and we just um, keep changing your opinion based on the opinion of the people you're talking to. You might do something like, well, there's lots of ways of doing it, but you might do something like, imagine building a chain, but we don't slow it down, but when it does fork, we have to figure out which fork we're going to go with. And uh, you just get to vote on which one you think is good, but you have to gamble some money on your vote. Ooh, that's interesting. So the idea is that you have some cryptocurrency or some stake that's of real monetary value that you personally have to be putting at risk as you vote on one of these two chains. And um, if you end up, if it turns out that you voted with the majority, then you get back your money with plus some extra. You get paid for having voted with the majority. But if it turns out that you were in the minority, then you lose some money. You know, that's one example of an economy-based system. Why do I say economy-based? Well, what's your motivation to try to match the rest of the community? Well, your motivation is you want to be able to make money. And if everybody is self-interested and acting independently, then Adam Smith's invisible hand of the market should cause emergent behavior that we'll all do the right thing and we'll have consensus. And if we're starting to fork too fast, then you're going to have this forest of forks. You're going to say, hmm, I don't know which one to vote on. I think I'll go a little bit slower now. And it self-regulates the speed. You don't have to do proof of work. You don't have to waste electricity. And so then you have this beautiful thing that we self-regulate our speed. We could potentially be fast because there's no leader that has to take turns. And we could potentially be resilient because there's no DDoS attacks. And it's beautiful. The only minor problem is, um, how secure is it? Uh, I don't know. Uh, nobody knows. Do you know how hard it is to prove security? Could you mathematically prove that the U.S. stock market will never crash again? No. No. <laughs> Why? Well, it's a complex system. It exhibits chaotic behavior. It's extremely sensitive to initial conditions, and, and you can't mathematically prove it's never going to crash. Oh, well, we'll just scrap the New York Stock Exchange. We'll start a new stock exchange. Could you prove that my new stock exchange will never crash? No. <laughs> it's a complex system involving, among other things, human psychology. It's a complex system with chaotic behavior. Could you prove that one of these systems will never come to a false consensus or never get stuck and there's no attacks on it? No. Well, what kind of attacks could you do? Well, during the couple of years that I was working on this, I thought of lots of really subtle attacks on the economy-based systems I thought of. And every time I thought of an, a subtle attack that would really destroy it, I thought of a way to, oh, I'll make this small change. That'll fix it. That attack won't work. Oh, but your small fix now allows this new little attack. Oh, well, I'll just fix that. But that new fix now allows a different subtle attack. And I just kept going back and forth. And I was never able to get a system that I could prove is resilient to every possible attack. I could never do a math proof. Just like no economist has ever proved that the world economy will never have uh, booms and busts. So I think the economy-based systems are really appealing. 
I wasn't able to find one that was asynchronous Byzantine. And for the last 35 years, really the things that have been proven asynchronous Byzantine have all turned out to be variants of the voting system. So that implies that we're not going to be able to get this economy-based system. Um, but there's certain things about it that I really like. We're just all randomly talking to each other and we come to an idea together. I really like that. There's no single point of failure. I like that. Um, the only thing I don't like is that I wasn't able to make it work. But it would be really cool if someone could make it work and prove Byzantine fault tolerance, asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerance for it. So that's the four. And then there's a fifth one, which is virtual voting. Virtual voting is all of the math proofs of the voting system because in some sense, if you look at it right, you are doing a voting system. It's just you're doing a voting system with no votes. Zero votes. Zero is a good number. Zero does not take long to send over the internet. I can send zero over the internet pretty fast um, in zero time using zero bandwidth. So with virtual voting, we were able to do that. But what do you build your virtual voting on? Well, you can't actually do it unless I know. <laughs> you have to know a lot. I have to know what everyone knows, but I also have to know when they knew it and in what order they learned it. You get that with a hash graph. And so we do the gossip protocol, and then we do gossip about gossip, and then we can do the virtual voting. And it actually incorporates the things that I thought were so cool about economy-based systems. There's no leader, there's no one to attack, there's no wasting electricity on proof of work. We're all just kind of talking to each other randomly and you just, you just get it. But we have mathematical proofs of asynchronous Byzantine and something else that you wouldn't necessarily have in other cases, we have a mathematical proof of fairness. Fairness meaning the ordering will reflect the timestamp and the timestamp will be basically when you reach the majority of the active community. Not just one computer's opinion of what the time was, but that when you reached the majority of the community and what all those computers together decided was the time. That's what we have. Those are the five ways to build a ledger. Wow, wow, yeah. <laughs>